education, his life, it's around it, boxing. He left school early, he didn't do his exam because all he wanted to do was box. So, say for instance, it's like, for him, it'd be like someone stole a day out of the week. You don't know who to blame, but you know something's missing. This is his life. Carl Frampton has his family and sometimes he switches off, you see him in between fights, he blows up a little bit. Every time you see Scott Quigg, this guy looks in great shape. So he lives the life. I think it'll hit him harder than it will uh, uh, Carl Frampton if he loses. And that's why I think it makes Scott Quigg a dangerous champion because he knows for himself he can't afford to lose. He just, he just, he can't even dream it, can't think it. Anthony, you obviously know Scott well. You're, you're part of the very, very successful Joe Gallagher stable, and you, you're evidence that you know, something is working. Something is working big time. Scott has has it all in front of him. Is this for him the night of destiny, the, the, the moment that he's asked for, and that now he will deliver? Without a doubt, Johnny's just said about him leaving school, uh, no education. No exam results. Scott, this this like this is his moment of destiny, and this is how Scott sees it. This isn't about Scott's achieved the goal, being a world champion, doing well on Saturday after Saturday. I think Eddie will tell you he's going to be uh, financially settled for life. But uh, this isn't about that for Scott Quick. Honestly, I think I know Scott almost as well as anyone, and he genuinely would do this for nothing on Saturday night. Genuinely would, and. Um, it's all about the win. <laughs> really, you know, but, no, it's, it's, you don't know how much this means to him until you're actually around him. And um, that's obviously my opinion. He won't be denied on Saturday night. It's, um, but for me, it's, it's great to see two lads, like we mentioned before, at the low weights, getting the recognition, selling out an arena in minutes, and putting on a, an unbelievable fight for British boxing. Anthony, you say you're closer than most. You're also, despite the fact you've done so well in your boxing career, you work the corners as well. You're very close to, to the whole training and set up with Joe Gallagher. Um, behind closed doors, when we're away from the sort of fanfare and, and the public quotes, how much do Team Quid fear Carl Frampton and, and the strengths and power that he possesses? Scott, Scott respects Carl Frampton. Scott. Scott knows fighting Carl Frampton similar the way to Kiko Martinez. He said to me, he says, I wake up every morning with fear, with the sort of knowing that I've got to push myself to better myself, to improve, to make sure the best Scott Quick turns up that night. And he very much had that with Kiko Martinez. And listen, I know Carl, Carl Frampton, in my opinion, is going to be a much tougher opposition than Kiko Martinez, but it's, I've saw Scott again, raise it again, when I didn't think he could be any more dedicated, train any more harder. That's what he's done in the gym. And um, I believe that's why he's, he's raised his level again. And I think that's what on Saturday night will show that. Eddie, obviously we know who, who you want to come through and, and win this fight. But what I want to know, I'm sure what the people want to know out there is, is how this all came together. And, and finally, after sort of you know years of, of waiting, we get the big match, we get the 50-50 duel, it's on. How tough was that? Yeah, the fight's been brewing for four years, and I think when I used to represent Carl, we were pushing for the fight so hard, but they were British and European champions at the time, Commonwealth champions, got big, uh, Carl Frampton as well. But when you look back, I was so desperate to make the fight at the time, and everyone kept saying, no, wait till they're both world champions. And to be honest with you, I looked at Scott Quigg and I thought, I'm not sure he's going to go on and win a world title. I've got this kid here, Carl Frampton. We're selling out this Odyssey Arena. Look at the crowd, they're going mad for him. Scott Quigg can't get a fight. He's got no promoter. He looks like a lost son. We beat him. But what happened after that is, is myself and Barry McGuigan had a little conversation that didn't go down too well and we parted ways. And then... I started talking to Scott Quigg. I actually, the night that Kiko Martinez beat, uh, sorry, Carl Frampton beat Kiko Martinez, I ended up in Subway with Scott Quigg. Um, because that night, there's a very famous interview where I say, Scott Quigg needs Carl Frampton, blah, 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 blah. And I looked up and Scott Quigg was 10 yards away and he was looking at me with daggers. And I, th I thought, I better go and buy him a Subway. So we went back to the hotel and I bought him a Subway and I sat down with him. And he, he was a really endearing man. And like Johnny goes back to about his life. I mean, you can't say that Scott Quigg doesn't have a life because Scott Quigg is so happy. 
in his life with what he does. But really, to the man on the street, Scott Quigg doesn't have a life. And he said something fascinating in the media, at the media lunch, which was, people talk about sacrifices they make. I don't make any sacrifices, because I love what I do. You know, the ex-fighters on this table, which is everyone, although Carl is active, but apart from you and me, Darren Barker, probably the greatest example, of someone that couldn't stand the gym and couldn't stand the camps. <laughs> Sorry, Darren, but true story. <laughs> but, but when you say, when Scott Quigg says to you, he says, there is nothing more I love than my alarm clock going off in the morning <laughs> to go and do my sprints. John, Any fighter. Though, when I was boxing, when I was training, I couldn't stand training. The reason being is because I felt sick because I trained that hard. And it's, it just surprises me that someone can enjoy feeling the way I did it. It was like, it was like training for a hangover. It was that bad, it felt sick. I mean, I, it just, I, I don't know if he's just saying it, because I just don't truly believe anyone, if you're training that hard, can enjoy doing it. You can't enjoy feeling like that. But, but so unless you're not training. Well, maybe he's just convinced himself that he loves it, but he definitely does love it. And that's the strange thing. And the more I got to know him, and I think Scott Reed is a different fighter now than he was to when he boxed Salinas. You know, he's come away, he's, he's not an extrovert. He doesn't like public speaking. You know, he's uncomfortable up there at press conferences. And some times people say, oh, he looks a bit lost. He just doesn't like to talk. But he's grown as a person and a fighter, even since the Salinas victory. You know, wins against you know, Silva, lower level opposition, Jamoy, Munyai was a good win. And then the acid test against Kiko Martinez. But the reason I fancy uh, Scott Quigg to win so much is when you're around him, and Crawler will know this more than anyone, you just look at him and you just, I just, I looked at him tonight and thought, you're not going to be denied here. I can see it in your eyes. And listen, I know it's a 50-50 fight, anything can happen, but my gut tells me he's not going to take no for an answer. And I, I think he's going to be very dangerous, and I think he's going to be clinical and brutal in this fight. And, and, and listen, for B British boxing, it's fantastic. Two great guys, two wonderful fighters, and, you know, Anthony was right. The, the, the division will never see a payday like this before. And I know fans aren't bothered about paydays, but I am because it's my job and my obligation to secure these people the paydays that when they walk away from the sport, they can just go out and watch Chelsea and get drunk with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to pick up any quickly on, on something Spencer mentioned earlier about um, Barrera and Morales having so many fights together and, and that's sort of what made each other. C can you see the classic on Saturday night meaning, you know, maybe both have to get up off the floor and there's a, a dramatic win or whatever. Can you see a sort of Frotch Grove story emulating or even two, three, we go to Belfast, we carry on and, and they sort of make each other over the next year or two? I think what you're absolutely guaranteed on Saturday night is drama. This arena has played with my emotions over the years. The first big one was David Hay against Audrey Harrison. And I had Audrey Harrison. <laughs> I thought I'd never work again in boxing, but Darren Barker phoned me up a couple of weeks later and said, I saw what you've done for Audrey Harrison. <laughs> if you can do that for Audrey Harrison, you've got to be able to do something with me. And then, yeah, and then we came back, and then I had Paul McCloskey in the Amir Khan fight, and that was a disaster. And then we had um, Anti Crawler against Darlis Perez. He boxes his ear off, ears off for 12 rounds, and we get robbed with a draw. And it was only actually last November when Anthony Crawler won the world title, which is just you know, a special night that none of us will ever forget, that the luck started to change at the arena. I think you'll see drama on Saturday. You may see controversy because there's that much on the line. Have you sold the dressing room out, have you? Not yet. We're still working <laughs> That'll be the most controversy. But, but I think that you're going to see a great fight. I think they both, there's no other fight in the division anywhere near the size of this fight. So the answer is, they're probably both dying for a great fight, so they can do it again. I think it's a great setting, isn't it? The Manchester Arena, as Eddie said, so many uh, fights over the years, you know, the likes of Mike Tyson coming, Joe Calzaghe and Prince Nassim Mohammed, obviously Ricky's fortress. It's been, it's been great to us, hasn't it? And I think we're, we're due another <coughs> fabulous humdinger of a fight. Um, Sam Clark on, on Twitter has asked this about the dressing room. <laughs> Does it really mean that much to both? on what dressing room they have. I'm going to go to the fighters here, the current fighter, Anthony Crawler. What does it mean, the, the dressing room on the night for you? If you were told 
next time when you, you defend your world title that you've got to go in the little one at the end? Is that a, a big deal or not? Me personally, I, I think I'm as laid back as you get. Like, Joe will be like, oh, this club, try this club. And I, it sounds unprofessional, but I couldn't care less. I'm like, Joe, it's sound, it's sound. No, wear these ones, try these ones. I'm just thinking, that don't go with my kit, so there's not a chance of wearing them. <laughs> but, um, I know for Scott and for Joe, it's, um, it's more, it's our principle, but that's a changing room that we, we've had for, like, say, Eddie's, when he's put me and Scott on together. And is it more like a team dressing room? Yeah, that's what it is. We, we used to be in there, and um, you're on about a smaller changing room. Scott would normally get the big one. Scott would be there nice and early. And um, it's something he's used to, and listen, does it make a difference? Does Scott think it's different if he don't get it? No, I don't, but I, honestly, I will be shocked if Scott McQuig isn't in that changing room on um, Saturday night. I genuinely mean that. It's because um, that, that could be like, say, it's a bit of um, a sticking point at the minute, but that's something he feels strong about. And I saw Carl saying about superstitious. And um, Scott, he, he doesn't believe in that. He believes he trains too hard to little things like that. Come down to much more out of principle. Darren, your greatest night, of course, was, was in America. I guess you didn't get the biggest dressing room there, did you? No, it was the box room. <laughs> very good. But I, 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 think I couldn't give a monkey's, honestly, what <laughs> change room was. It makes no odds. It may, and, and to be honest, um, for me, if I, if I was not whinging about what train, change room I wanted to go in or what, uh, what corner I'm in or who comes out first, I think you come across more of a dangerous fighter. That all your all you care about is that first goal going and getting down to business. You don't give. Uh, you're not worried about the changing room or the gloves or anything like that. It's all a load of rubbish. Getting him and that bell goes. None of it matters. To be fair, I did want an ensuite, <laughs> but you know you can't have everything. So it, I, I never I never was bothered about anything like that. Um, Eddie might say I thought Ezra. I don't think I did. Bothered at all, Spencer? Do you no. remember it so long ago? Yeah, no, not bothered at all. If I'm honest, I think that. That was the least of my problems, um, to worry about the size of the dressing room. It was about the opponent you had in front of you. I mean, to warm up somewhere really didn't bother me. And I think that, just to echo really what Anthony was saying, if it was part of their, if, if, if all the boys have been going there all the time and they're used to having that environment and whatnot, then I can see a little argument being made there. But really, if I'm honest, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me at all. And I, don't, and I wouldn't see it being a massive issue, as, as Darren said, I think that, if that's, if that's a problem and you're making that a problem, then you know, that's, that's probably the wrong thing to do at this stage of the game. I'm sure it'll all be sorted one way or the other. Robert Pask on Twitter, uh, his question's a general one, so I'm going to go to Dave and Johnny about this. How much boxing skill is based on ability and how much on hard work? Johnny, you are known for your skills and you had to do a lot of hard work around, uh, especially your time away abroad. Well, I wasn't a naturally, gift, naturally gifted fighter, so uh, you're thinking the end result, I was. I wasn't. And so to me, hard work uh, says it all, and then the skill comes after that. Um, the thing is, Carl Frampton has a skill. Uh, uh, um, Scott Quigg has the, has the hard work ethic. Uh, but I do think um, Scott is big enough, is bold enough, is, is focused enough for his hard work to be good enough to talk uh, Carl Frampton into his kind of fight. And if he does that, he gets the win. Because skills, listen, you, 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 the buzzword in sport now is strength and conditioning. So you'll see all these guys get a personal strength and conditioning trainer, and you think they're, 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 the dog's bollocks, excuse me. But if they concentrate on skill as much as they do on strength and conditioning, that's when you see the likes of Floyd Mayweather beating Canal Alvarez. You know, he worked on skill. Skill was everything. He outboxed him, outfoxed him, outmoved him. Alvarez is strong, he's brutal. If he, got in front, if he managed to get his hands on Floyd, he'd have taken him out. But the skill was enough. I'm not saying Carl Frampton has that kind of skill. I'm, what I'm saying is, Scott Quigg has the mindset and the, 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 the force to talk Carl Frampton into his kind of fight. And if he can do that, this makes it an even dog match. Uh, because if he depends on skill, if he depends on trying to outbox Carl Frampton, then there's a problem. He needs to drag this man to his kind of fight. He does that, we'll see a different result. Now it's down to uh, Carl Frampton to make sure he doesn't do that. And that's why the corners 
win and lose this fight for both fighters because they've got to get these guys to stick to the game plan. Dave, you're a good little fighter. Uh, back in the day, we saw some, uh, well, we saw some really good action with you. Remember Terrace Gaskin and, and others. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to ask you more as a trainer now because um, you've got the likes of, of people like Jamie and Gavin McDonald. And you said today about Gavin that you know he puts a hundred percent in every time. That's what you love about him. So how much is it based on that hard work? And how much does it matter, especially at this level now, when you're talking about the, the world, the elite, on the skills? Is it, a, is it just the perfect combination is what you're looking for? Well, you'd, ideally, you'd like the perfect combination. But a lot of times, the guys that are naturally more talented and, and naturally more skillful are the guys that look for little ways out. A little bit of an easier session today, come in and not, not graft as much, not listen as much. Sometimes in a corner, they might think they, will, they know a little bit more. We, we were case in point when we, we saw in the gym with Naz. Naz was absolutely phenomenal, you know, we both saw that. But me growing up as a kid in the gym, not kissing his ass because he's here, but Johnny was the one that was grafted, grafted, grafted. And, and, I, you know, and I saw him where it was, it was all about Harold, it was all about Naz coming through, and then he just kept on going and going and going, despite his losses, despite his setbacks. He just worked hard, and he was the one that outlasted them all, you know. Um, whereas Naz got to a level, as soon as he won, his, as soon as he signed his Sky deal, really, he kind of switched off, didn't he? He, he? he used to train all the time. <laughs> and yes, yeah, he <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> Adam at the time. Well, I'm still playing. <laughs> <laughs> but he used to train all the time, twice a day, every day, whether he got a fight or not. As soon as he signed his Sky deal, he just started training eight weeks for a fight. Yeah. So because he had that natural ability, toss it off a little bit, come in and still smash everybody up. Who's got more natural ability then, Carl Frampton or Scott Frank, Quigg? For me, Frampton. For you, Frampton, Darren, as for well? For me, Frampton, yeah. more Spencer? Natural. 100%. Eddie? More natural skill? Yeah, I think probably more natural skill. Yeah. Anton? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, listen, with the pedigree that Carl's got, um, certainly the better boxing skills, but just say going off the question, he <laughs> <laughs> could argue he's got the natural, better natural ability. Johnny, Johnny, so yeah. I do. I think Carl Frampton has a uh, uh, more natural ability, but it's not. It won't be enough if you don't get his game plan right. Tony Nelson on Twitter has asked, uh, which undercard fight guys are you most looking forward to? <laughs> Gavin and Donald, obviously with uh, with Dave. Just a line about that fight. It's a dangerous one for him. Oh, 100%. It's, um, it's another big step up for him, but the, the guy that we're fighting, is, he, he is a big puncher. He's a fast starter, um, but my worry is that Gavin's notoriously a slow starter. James is a little bit of a slow starter as well, but Gavin usually takes you know, a good three rounds, and he can't afford to do that. <laughs> because if he gets in the first three rounds, he's going to know about it. So he's got to be um, very clever early doors, um, not take much punishment, and, and then come on. But this guy is... You know, he, he, he can fight. Unless he's preparing for Josh Warrington, of course, this guy. Yeah, what's that about? Uh, um, Gavin McDonald in a, in, a, in a big fight. Eddie, you put the cards <laughs> together. What, what's the one that stands out um, to you? Two, two fights particularly is uh, the British Lightning.